open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Welcome to 3ABN Australia Homecoming. Hello, my name's John Malkovich and with And me I'm Rosemary Malkovich. That's right. And you know, we, we, we want to welcome you to the 3ABN Australia Homecoming 2022. We're recording this in the studio in Morissette, New South Wales, just north of Sydney. And our topic for our theme, or our theme I should say, is open my eyes. The Word of God contains wonderful truths. And each one of you, I am sure, want to know what God is revealing to us in His Word. Well, our last program, it was Pastor Kyle Allen, Vice President of Adventist World Radio. And this is the summary of his sermon, Why Should I Believe in God? And the summary says, We see evidence for belief in God through, one, creation. God is seen in the works of nature around us and in the amazing way we are created. We are created in a wonderful way. Two, the Word of God. God reveals himself through his Word, which is reliable and trustworthy. Prophecy confirms the truth and reliability of the Bible. Three, personal experience. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, God has changed my life and the lives of others. And I can say he has done the same for me. Mm -hmm. I like the thought that we are created in the image of God and that makes us his special creation. Mm. You know, our speaker for the hour will be Pastor Burren Newenstraten and I'm sure that you will enjoy what he has to say. He's speaking on creation. Is it true? Good question. Is it, it is true? And uh, for our musical item, we have Pastor Marty and Tanae Thompson and they will be singing for us Grace. But before they pray, Rosemary, would you like to offer a prayer? Oh, before they present their oh, music, sorry. I yes. will pray. <laughs> Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you for your greatness. We thank you for your creation. We thank you for creating us so wonderfully and the systems in our body and the bodies of every animal and every living thing. Father, because you are so great, we worship you but also you condescend to be with us and in us. And we thank you for your presence right here, right now, through the Holy Spirit. I pray that you will bless Pastor Burrand, New Stratton, and that you will bless Marty and Tanae Thompson as they present the music. Open our hearts, open our eyes, and those who listen to this message today. May each one of us be drawn to you and be with us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. My heart is so proud. My mind is so I see the things you do through me as great things I have done and now you gently break me then lovingly you take me and hold me as my father and mold me as my maker I ask you how many times will you pick me up when I keep on letting you down and each time I will fall short of your glory how far will forgiveness abound and you answer my child I love you and as long as you're seeking my face you'll walk in the power of my daily sufficient grace. At times I may grow weak, and
and feel a bit discouraged knowing that someone somewhere could do a better job for who am i to serve you i know i don't deserve you keeps me hanging on I ask you how many times will you pick me up when I keep on letting you down and each time I will fall short of your glory how far will forgiveness abound and you answer my child I love you and as long as you're seeking my face, you'll walk in the power of my daily sufficient grace. As I walk with you, I'm learning what your grace really means. The price that I could never pay was paid at Calvary so instead of trying to repay you I'm learning to simply obey you by giving up my life to you for all that you've given to me I ask you how many times will you pick me up when I keep on letting you down and each time I will fall short of your glory how far will forgiveness abound and you answer my child I love you and as long as you're seeking my face you walk in the power of my daily sufficient grace Thank you for that beautiful music. I really enjoyed that and wonderful to have you here. And it's great to be able to talk about a topic which I've had a passion about oh, for many years. But we just uh, might we just invite the Holy Spirit as well as we talk about this uh, particular topic. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can speak about things in the freedom that we enjoy and so often take for granted. What a wonderful thing it is to have your word what a wonderful thing it is to have you as our God and as our maker. It is beautiful to know that. And Lord, bless us, open our minds, open our hearts. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I like to think that uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to say, that you can understand that and that you can follow me. And if you have some trouble with that, I, I don't blame you. But um, here it is popular perception about creation whether it's true or not popular perception science and evolution you've heard this haven't you science science and evolution go together and faith and creation belong together but i want to put it to you that having studied this topic for so long and i've spoken on many occasions i can assure you it really factual actual is the other way around Consider this, I believe that science and creation go beautifully together. Just to use a cliche, they both have the same author. Does that resonate with you? Wonderful. And when you look at, uh, when you look at evolution, you need a lot of faith. I used to believe in evolution. I really tried very hard until science presents itself with the fact and you can't help but saying, this is not on. That is not what happened. And so there it is. There are basically four basic propositions that we just touched on in the time that is given to us. There is a special and a 
instantaneous creation as per Genesis 1 and 2, uh, of course, and of the Bible. It's biblical. Here's another thing. Jesus believed it. Jesus taught it. He taught in the beginning he, God, created them male and female. He referred to the books of Moses if they would have believed in the books of Moses, and it starts with Genesis, which is Bereshit in the Hebrew, but they would have believed in him as well. It's interesting, Jesus believed in it. And here is the thought. If creation isn't true, don't waste your time believing in a savior, because he's not there. It couldn't have been him. And uh, of course, the other thing to consider, Jesus did it. John, the gospel, first chapter, verse three, whatever was made, everything that was made, was made by him. You're familiar with the text. That is what it states. The other possibility is theistic, that's entertained anyway, theistic evolution, meaning that God availed himself to a, uh, what shall we say, to a process of evolution, uh, intermittently perhaps intervening. That was the basic, the basic perception that a lot of Christians, frightfully how many, a lot of Christians uphold. But here it is. The Bible says that death, disease, and suffering came into the world as a result of sin. Now, if Christians allow for death, suffering, and disease before sin, we have a huge problem. The Bible is not correct. And the meaning of the cross and the atonement, in principle, are disarmed, destroyed. It's a sad thing, but that is what you'd have to conclude. In fact, if you, go, if you go now a bit further with theistic evolution, uh, I look at the, the apostle or, or the, uh, let's, before we get to the apostle, I think that's important too. But let's just look at this. How can all things be restored in the future? Think about this. Just think about this. How can all things be restored in the future to no more death, no more suffering, unless the beginning was also free of death and suffering? Because that wouldn't be a restoration, wouldn't it, if you didn't go back to that? So there had to be a divine ability to make it like that, to make it as a perfection. When we consider on the theistic evolution, we look at the statement of the Apostle Paul in the, the first letter to the Corinthians and the 15th chapter. I love this one. I find this one magnificent. You know, you quote it every time. You quote it every time when you have a funeral and you officiate. Behold, he said, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That means, he says, no, we shall not all be passed away, died and buried. Uh, of course, the people in his days believed that Jesus might come back in their own days. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. I love this one, in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, the twinkling of an eye. No Jenny Craig, no nothing. The twinkling of an eye. Wonderful. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. That is an incredible ask for someone to come out of the grave after decomposition to be instantaneous with a body that is endowed with immortality and absolute perfection. My God can do that. That's what he says. And I believe him with all my heart. There is another form that is atheistic evolution. No God, no deity, no intelligence out there. So that, of course, is another consideration. When a person cannot believe in God or a religion, you have no option but to accept evolution. Now let's look at number four. That's quite a, an interesting one. And that is basically a panspermia evolution. It's the belief that, an, 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 what shall I say, a basic form of biological life that we are familiar with was introduced to this planet and it then evolved from simple to complex and in the various species and, and on and on and on. The trouble with that is, that is a relocation of the problem. 
if you can't explain and prove that life began spontaneously here, that our forebearers is really in the arms of the chemistry, how are you going to explain, how are you going to explain by transporting it to another planet? Of course, it has to be another planet. Now, when we look at our own solar system, it has to be said that none of the other planets could have hosted biological life as we know it and as we are a part of it. So you transport a problem from one place to another and then you add a transportation problem. And the transportation problem is where are you going to get this life from? How does it travel through space? Space is hostile to biological life. And of course you only increase the problems. When we look at the environmental support factors, they are very important. I think that that is one very worthy consideration. I remember I had a professor of anatomy and his particular interest was histology. And I remember, this is all oh, 55 years ago, plus I hate to admit it. And I looked at what would purportedly be a biological cell and I wonder how the permeability of the cellular structure could allow to the, the, the ingredients imported into the cell to maintain the metabolism and how it would expel the waste products in order to survive as a viable cell. It puzzled me and I knew that if the complexity that has to be in place to provide a permeability of a cellular wall is not intact 100%, there is no hope of the next generation. This couldn't be, and that's just the way it is. And so, look at some of the basic, look at some of the basic environmental, what shall I say, requirements. And I'm just going to go through a list. I'm going to mention 20, just 20. Correct distance from the sun. True, that makes sense. Terrestrial planet has to be the right size. It has to have a magnetic field, and I could dwell on each and every one of the comments why I'm just going to read through them and hope that you know most of them. Has to have a magnetic field, a correct oxygen-nitrogen ratio, enough oxygen to support organic life, correct ozone levels, sufficient water vapor density, the right gravity, correct speed of rotation around its axis, a correct axis tilt which it has at 23 and a half degrees, secured by the position of the moon and as it goes in orbit around the sun once yearly, we are guaranteed of the seasons. A sufficient carbon dioxide levels, which we need to have, photosynthesis. Sufficient land mass, right speed of orbit, that is an annual orbit around the sun. Enough liquid water, all necessary minerals and ele elements that you've got to have. Correct location in the galaxy, not the whole of the galaxy is, is, is favorable for organic life. Correct type of star, the moon to stabilize the axis to guarantee, the, as I already mentioned, the seasons. A right thickness of Earth's crust, protected by giant planets. I've just mentioned only 20. There are far more. I want you to see something. So if I look at the next slide, if I look at the left slide, the environmental support factors for organic life, the 20 factors that I, I, I've referred to. I don't know how you pronounce this number, and I'm not even going to try. That are your chances that that by accident would be compliant to all the conditions. There's a book that I would highly recommend, The Privileged Planet by Guillermo Gonzalez and J.W. Richard. Gonzalez is an astronomer. J.W. Richard is a, an analytical philosopher. <clears throat> they compiled this particular book. They both senior fellows of a, a, a wonderful institute of the Discovery Institute. Uh, it's a great little book. I really recommend it. Good considerations. Now we're looking at the other supports that we uh, bring up for our philosophy, belief that the nature of biological change has been determined by God. Look at mutations, mutations. Our body, we are endowed with 100 trillion cells on average, some more than others. Mutations only find place one in every 10 million. They're minor, insignificant, if you like, most of them, most of them neutral, if not detrimental, 
but never, never accumulative. Let's have a look at this. Mutations point back to creation. Mutations only change in existing genes. You cannot have a mutational change unless you have the gene. Does that make sense? Of course it does. And so if the, the trend is not uppered by, what shall I say, an improvement to evolve into another species or upgrade, then your problem is you must come from a perfection and mutations are only changes in existing genes. There must have been perfect genes. It definitely points to creation, no doubt about it. Mutations are not, uh, what shall I say, complementary. They're not cumulative. It has never been proven. In fact, I want to say something. When we look at the next slide, there's something I, I want to show you. There was a mm, tremendously important meeting in October 1980. Now, I know that that is 42 years ago, but that hasn't changed since. This was held by leading evolutionists all over the world at the Chicago conference. And the central question, the central question was whether the mechanisms underlying microevolution, that is speciation within a species, let me give you an example, you have uh, uh, 500 different types of ducks, you might not have known that, but you do now. You have many hundreds of different types of dog, cats, etc., but they're all dogs, cats, and of course, they are of a kind that has not transferred to another. The central question was whether the mechanisms underlying microevolution can be extrapolated, this was the ambition, the central question, to explain the phenomenon of macroevolution. Macroevolution is from one kind to another. Microevolution is speciation within a kind. Did you get that? That's great. Do you know that the answer was, and these are, ev these are evolutionists, all of them, it was a resounding no. You could not extrapolate what happened in, in the speciation within the species to a macroevolution. And as I said, that has not changed in any way at all. And so, <clears throat> let's look at it. The probability of a single cell, I want you to take this very serious. This man, Charles Eugene Guy, who said this, had a pupil by the name of Albert Einstein. So he was good. He was also professor of physics. He's a mathematician. This is what he says. The probability of a single cell forming by evolution through limitless time, particles and events has been calculated by a Swiss mathematician, this is the one, Charles Eugen Guy, odds to the power, 10 to the power of 160. That is enormous. And in fact, statisticians point out that anything beyond 10 to the power of 50 is beyond reason essentially impossible and absolutely absurd as a proposition. Now that must make you think, surely. And as we continue, <coughs> I like this one. <coughs> the man George Gallup, you've heard of the Gallup poll, haven't you? Of course you have. He says this, he said, I could prove God statistically. Take the human body alone, the chance that all the functions of the individual would just happen is a, and I quote George Gallup, is a statistical monstrosity. It cannot be argued. And so this is fascinating. That's the man that should know. And so as we go continue here, we see that the impossibility of self-replication without the required complexity is just not possible. It has never been observed in order to arrive at sufficient positive mutations. Now you've got to understand what as an evolutionist you need are mutations that are positive that will project you to the next stage of the, of the species and, and, and increase it. That's not been observed. Here is something that you'd like. I love this one. I mean, you've heard of dinosaurs. We all, we all grew up stories with dinosaurs. Did you know that the word dinosaur means actually terrible lizard? Now it's interesting, that word has only been around by about 200 years. Now, now, in the olden days, people used to speak of dragons. You know, every, every culture has dragons and myth and stories. And 
the interesting thing is this. They did always find certain bones. They didn't know what they were. There was never, never on record an attempt to reconstruct any of the bones of the dinosaurs that were found. They just didn't know what they were. So no reconstruction of a dinosaur, no knowledge what a dinosaur looked like. Can you remember that? Look at him. No knowing at all up to a few hundred years ago when we started to put them together. Prior to that, no idea what they even looked like. Now, this is interesting, with that in mind. In recent years, and I'm quoting from an article, there have been many findings of, and it's called, wonderful preserved biological material in support of supposedly ancient rock layers and fossils. Keep following this. One such discovery that has left evolutionists scrambling is a fossilized Tyrannosaurus rex femur with flexible connective tissue, that is fibrous, high fibrous tissue. Branching blood vessels, I've seen it, and intact cells, blood cells. Amazing. Now, according to evolutionists, these dinosaurs' tissues are more than 65 million years old. 63 or 65, take your pick. Either way, it's a long time ago. 65 million years ago, it died out. They died out. How? Uh, I won't even tell you the story. It holds no water. But laboratory studies have shown that there is no known way. Now, I stress again, no known way. In fact, and likely none possible for biological material to last more than thousands of years. Not, not millions of years. But here is the fact. If we could, Dr. Mary Schweitzer, the paleontologist who is an evolutionist, and I think she's still trying to be one. The paleontologist of North Carolina State University did the finding and she had a, Jennifer Whitmire was her very able assistant. Discovering of the remains of blood cells in dinosaurs' fossils. Later discovering the soft tissues remains in the Tarasanus rex specimen that was actually in, I think, March of 2005. So it's been around. What I'm trying to say, we for 17 years have known that soft tissues of the dinosaurs, and in fact multiple dinosaurs have been found like this, they still had recognizable detectable soft tissues which can only mean they can only be thousands of years old. This is a very sobering exercise. Let's have a look what she had to say, Mary Schweitzer. Let me go to the next one. A lot of people are not willing, she says, to accept the data we come up with. They don't. I mean, they came around 230 million years ago. They died out 65, 63 million years ago. That is standard in all the textbooks that goes to all the schools. A lot of people are not willing, she said, to accept the data we come up with, a mechanism for preservation. Well, we're not there yet. All I can say is, here is what we see, she says, here is what we see, here is what we have done, and here are our results. It almost sounds like an apology. But this is interesting. The presence of detectable carbon-14 found in all tested dinosaur bones, all of them, not some, dinosaur bones and DNA, partial DNA granted, but still residual DNA that purportedly has a half-life of 521 years. It's amazing. Carbon-14, that is really a datable uh, mechanism for organic matter. And even by evolutionary standard, even by evolutionary standard, it cannot exceed 50,000 years because it won't be detectable. That leaves a far cry short of the 65 million years ago when they died out. So there it is, and that is in Nova uh, Science now in May 2010. Let's talk about something else. Um, another angle of this whole saga of the dinosaurs. So if they are between 230 and 65 million years ago roaming this planet, long before humans, 
We reportedly have only been around for 200,000 years, 150,000, somewhere in between. But you know, <clears throat> it's easily disproven what evolution holds up. There are dinosaur carvings, paintings in caves all around the world. I could quote a number of places. In fact, there, there are some beautiful, very clear Inca ceremonial burial stones for the Nazca culture, which is up to 200 BC. And they have depictions of the, mainly the bigger dinosaurs that we have reconstructed only since the last 200 years. My point is this. If the dinosaurs died out 63, 65 million years ago, how is it that we can find, that we can find depicting carvings, uh, even clay modules, fairly accurately of what the dinosaurs looked like unless it was observed by human beings and passed on from generation to generation. Are you with me here? Doesn't that make sense? The apes didn't draw that. It's serious. And so there's the evidence that there was a coexistence between these dinosaurs, as per biblical account, day six, between dinosaurs and human beings. Simple, you don't have to be really a science to work this one out. Now, how old is the universe? I love that question. The Big Bang happened, you know, 13.7 billion years ago, and our solar system 4.3 billion years. I have never found an adequate explanation. I'm not sure what it's based on. I know there are lots of theories, none of them, none of them really prove this. But let's just look at this. A Big Bang was caused because of an implosion of gravitational forces, an incredible intensity of spinning, and with that, with that concentration of the imploded energy, there was an explosion that formed the whole of the universe, they say. Here is a problem. If that would have been the case, then with the spinning and the explosion, everything should move and spin the same way. Do you follow me in this one? And so the law of conservation of angular momentum is the one law that is not complied with in this theory. Jupiter, Saturn and Neptune, you know, there are 91 moons between the three, eight of them rotate the other way. How do you explain that? In fact, in fact, if you go further, Venus, Uranus and Pluto most likely rotate backwards, the opposite way. And there are whole galaxies recognized as moving the other way. And that would really seriously challenge the theory of a Big Bang uh, occurrence uh, 14, 15 billion years ago. And so here's another little one that I find very interesting, our moon. If you look at our moon, did you know that the moon is actually, the space between the Earth and the moon is actually increasing by four centimeters? You haven't noticed? You don't look much at the moon, do you? The distance to the Earth, 384 plus thousand kilometers. But it's increasing by four centimeters. Now the man who put this paper out, and that is already back there in some 32 years ago by the astronomer uh, Don de Young. He's a creationist, professor of physics, and subject to peer review, reconfirmed with laser nowadays. It's easy to affirm this. And the reason why the moon is slowly moving away is because of the tidal pull of the oceans, and I won't go into that. But what is fascinating, if you go back 1.4 billion years, the moon should be touching the earth. And evolutionists say, yeah, it was part of the earth. No, it wasn't. Specific weight is fairly different. The consistency is different. There's nothing to suggest. There's no mechanism that is demonstrable to have the moon, a moon body separated from the earth. It just didn't happen. 1.4 billion years ago, it would touch the earth. What do you do with 4.3 billion? Well, 4.3 billion means that if it moves away four centimeters per year, it should have been right out of sight by now. And the moon is responsible for 60% of our tidal waves, tidal uh, waters, which is so important for our ecology. Amazing. 
it's not hard to really draw this whole thing in doubt. I, I, there's another one I like to talk to you about. That is day four of the creation account of the, of the book of Genesis. The question is this. Did God create the stars on day four of creation week? Because if he did, and it's some, as we say, 6,000 years ago, the problem would be, the problem would be, how do you explain stars, light, that has come to us, and they are at least a million or many millions light years away from us. And many have said, many critics, you can tell that the Bible is just a book because it postulates it was there not before 6,000 years ago. And this is the text <clears throat> pardon me, that's normally used. The belief that the Bible teaches that the stars were created on day six, or sorry, on day four, 6,000 years ago. But you know, it's wonderful when you go to the original language and you appreciate the grammar of the Hebrew. Did you know that the Hebrew does not compel us to believe in any way at all that all the stars were made 6,000 years ago or thereabouts. In fact, in fact, when you look at the bottom of the English text, and uh, I'll just read the whole text, and God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the, the, the lesser light to, to rule the night. Of course, the daytime is the sun, the night is the, is the moon who gets its light from the sun. And then there is a, like a little appendix and the stars. In fact, in most of your translations, you may want to check that up. It, it says, and he made the stars also. But made was not there. Now in the Hebrew, when you go to the Hebrew writing, and I appreciate you don't know that, you go to the bottom, and right at the bottom it says, ve'ed ha'kochavim, that is the white characters between the yellow, it is a direct object link. And the direct object link puts the object in touch with the action, which is he made, the verb. What the author is saying here, he is very much saying that the sun and the moon were positioned and made, created day four. But he wanted to exempt the star and place it somewhere differently, but yet connected it with a direct object link right to the action he made it. In other words, God made everything consistent with the whole of the Bible without in, in imploring a, uh, what shall I say, uh, a need to uh, accept it to be put in place, all the stars to be put in place 6,000 years ago. So that's good to know. I've, I've written a word underneath that big number four. The sun was created on day four. So what was the light source prior to that? Because the first day God created light, that correct? Yes, he did. So he created light. And God, and I'll show you the text in a minute, saw that it, it was good. The light on day one was good. Imagine, just imagine, if the light on day one might have been from the sun. We have no atmosphere to protect the planet. Prior to that, it was in darkness. The second verse of Genesis says so. No energy source in dark space, the temperature would be what they call Kelvin, minus 270 degrees Celsius. There would have been a frozen uh, unit of, of dirt and water. And then you would suddenly expose it to a sun with a capacity to defrost instantly, fairly instantly, what we see here, the mass, the planet itself. Now this is interesting. Sublimation is an expression for a matter that changes from one consistency, in this case ice, to a gaseous consistency. So from solid to gas, to water vapor. In the absence of an atmosphere and lacking the protection thereof, much of the water would have evaporated from the planet and its thermal velocity would have seen to it that we would have lost, I know it deserves a lot more explanation, but it really is easily, something you can easily work out, we would have lost much of our water which is so pivotal to our creation. We would have lost it, uh, hydrogen is very light anyway. Amazing that a book like the Bible, this fascinated me, look at the moon, 
if there is water, it'll be in the form of ice, not in fluid water. Won't happen because there is no atmosphere to speak of. And so this is very different where we are. I think it is a remarkable thing that we can look at the moon and say, it's not there, and we look at our planet, but it is here. And I think that is one of the wonders of the Bible that it makes a provision why the water was still preserved. And that was done because of the component of the infrared would have destroyed the water levels of this planet. Just a consideration. How long were the days of creation? That's a, that's a good question. Then God said, let there be light. We just talked about that. There was light and God saw the light that it was good. It was suitable for the condition. There is no atmospheric pressure yet that came the next day when the waters were separated from the waters in a vertical sense. And God saw the light that it was good and God divided, notice, the light from the darkness, so it is directional, God, like the sun, God called the light day and the darkness he called night, so the evening and the morning were the first day. Now. Let me ask the question and undo the philosophy that the six days in creation are just eons of ages divided in six slots. Not possible, because this text says this. The author, three and a half thousand years ago, described the process of a day and a night, evening, light into darkness, morning, darkness into light. And then he calls that the first day. Now, when we go to the next slide, I want to see you some. There's only one word that is changed. It says one day. In your Bible, it most likely says it was the first day. No, no. The author is describing day, he's describing night, he's describing an evening, he's describing a morning, and he says that process is one day. When you look at the Hebrew, right there on the left-hand side, because you read from right to left, when you look at that word there, echad, that is a cardinal number, not an ordinal number. Ordinal number is first, second, third, fourth, five, sixth. Yeah, that correct? Cardinal numbers, one, two, three, four, etc. And so we have a description of a day by the author describing what he was accustomed to at his time of living three and a half thousand years ago. There could have been no long ages accommodating any evolutionary processes. Eliminated. Let's look at the cosmology and the Bible. I love cosmology, it's fascinating. Look at this one. This one is so good. Can you bind the cluster of the Pleiades or loosen the belt of Orion? Now, you find it in Job 38th chapter, verse 31. Now, you say, well, yeah. Well, look at this. Johann Heinrich von Maitler, he was the director of the Berliner Observatorium, published many scientific works. He was obviously an astronomer. He was very good, but not always right. But what he noticed in the middle of the 19th century, what he noticed in the middle of the 19th century with the, the instrumentality that he had to measure distancing between the stars. As he looked at the Pleiades, he discovered that the Pleiades, the cluster, moves as an integral cluster through space, preserving its integrity of distances between them. With the naked eye, 15 to 16 suns, stars, with the Hubble telescope, hundreds of them, but the uniqueness of that cluster of the Pleiades, by way of exception of, a, of an expanding universe, is preserving its cluster. And of course, the Pleiades, as you may know, is part of the constellation of, of Taurus. What I'm saying here is this. There is no document, and I've challenged many an atheist on this, there is no document available from antiquity or prior to the 19th century that could confirm that statement other than the Bible, a cosmological fact that has been proven time and time again to be correct. Lose the belt of Orion appeals to me. My belt over the years has been expanding somewhat, and I think I'm not the only one. 
The Mintaka, the Alnitaka, and the Alnilam are the three main stars of the belt of Orion. Now they travel in tremendous velocity to completely different directions, expanding the belt of Orion, Orion the hunter. Again, you will find nothing in antiquity or prior to the 19th century to find a statement like that. Johann Heinrich von Maitler proved that the Bible was inspired. I don't know whether he intentionally did that, but he did. There it is. The worldwide flood, let's look at that. If the creation account is true, the flood account has to be true. Let me repeat that. If, if the creation account is true, the flood account has to be true too. I can give you many reasons for that. If the flood account is proven, then creation is proven. That's the point. Let me give you a couple of reasons for that. If we go into the next slide, I want you to see this one. One can't prove that God does not exist, but science makes God unnecessary. Who said that? Men by the name of Stephen Hawkins. A theoretical physicist, he said that. Uh, but here we have another theoretical physicist by the name of Albert Einstein. The more I study science, the more I believe in God. I like that. I like that. That impresses me. So we're looking at the same evidence. We are looking at the same evidence, both the same disciplines of science. One yields towards God and his handiwork. The other one moves away from God. Do you know evolution is a choice? It is not based on science. It is a matter of choice. And deep down, if God doesn't suit you, you will reject, reject him. The origin of life. <clears throat> I'd like to quote Sir Fred Hoyle. I don't know whether you're familiar with this person, a highly respected British physicist, an astronomer. Actually, he believed in panspermia, feeding, uh, seeding on this planet of biological life. He's still an evolutionist, but I want you to see what he said. He was very honest and very precise. This is what he said. The likelihood of the formation of life from inanimate matter is one to a number with 40,000 zeros. That comes from the other side. It is big enough to bury Darwin and the whole theory of evolution. And he says, he says, there was no prime evil soup, neither on this planet or any other. And if the beginnings of life were not random, there must have therefore been the product of a purposeful intelligence. Now let's hold it right there. Why is it? And this is not uncommon, this is quite frequent, that you find people, that you find those who adhere to an evolutionary process, they place God out of it. God plays no role. But the science clearly and honestly, predictively points towards a creator, someone who is an intelligent designer. You can see it all around you. I've quoted a number of people here, a number of people. And I quote Sir Fred Hoyle, whom I greatly respect because the man was a fantastic scientist. But here it is. Can't get himself to give the credit to at least an intelligent designer. I have not mentioned, I have not mentioned uh, DNA. Fantastic, what a tremendous, what a tremendous discovery that was. Um, it changed the whole perception of bio biology. Charles Darwin, Charles Darwin, so revered and still honored today, had no idea when he looked at a, a biological cell, to him it was just a, a cell with protoplasm, he had no idea what was inside it. And as science progresses, I remember I remember having my argument and debates with an atheist group at the Macquarie University. And as we obviously separated with different opinions, and we did, this was the interesting thing. How will we ever settle the question? How will we ever settle the issue about creation? 
or evolution. And we both agreed, for once we agreed. You know how we agreed on this? Science will prove it. And science does prove it. And I remember changing camps. I remember very well when I changed sides and I embraced the creation account of the Bible. It's been wonderful. It's been great. A sense of purpose of who I am, what I am, and why I am. It is incredible. How could you live without it? So sad to live without it. There is another argument I just want to bring into the equation, and that is really about the ancient prophecies proof of inspiration. It's part of the argument, part of the proposition, that the Bible is a trustworthy account, historical account, of how everything came into being. I look at the ancient prophecies, and you're familiar with them. The book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, apocalyptic prophecies stretching for thousands of years with a 100% accuracy. A 100% accuracy. That is marvelous. I look at that and I, I, every time when I still teach it, I, be it individually or collectively with a group, every time as I prepare, and I always do prepare, I still prepare, though I think I know it by heart, there are, there are wonderful truth in the, in the biblical prophecies, in its accuracy, in its application. It's a gold mine. It's wonderful. The point is, the Bible is a wonderful book. It just is not a book just of prophecy. It's not just a book of origin. It is a book of both. Only the one, only the one that gave us life, who created us, only the one who controls everything. He is the only one who can foretell the end from the beginning. I trust this book because I go to the prophecies and I feel and I see and I understand that, you know, God has confirmed time and time again. Why would I forego my origin, knowing full well and you know, it's hard sometimes to look in the mirror and say, I'm created in the image of God, but he did lovingly so, didn't he? We have a wonderful God, a lot to be grateful for. Let's just bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we, uh, that we could discuss this uh, today, that we could look at the tremendous realities from science confirming you that through your word and utilizing the authorship of Moses, we have such a wonderful, accurate account of not just creation, but of the magnificent flood, which has never been disproven, and yet the evidence, of course, is all around us. We thank you for that, and we thank you also for the prophecies, and we thank you that both are in the same book, your word, the Bible, God's word, your word. Lord, it is inspired, and we thank you for you explaining this to us. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for being so uh, generous in all the, the evidences that we so desperately need in a world that is so skeptical. We know for certain that your word is trustworthy and may it strengthen us and keep us and guide us. In Jesus' most precious name we pray, amen. May God bless you and thank you for being here.